Appreciate the good job on the reading by our brother Nathan and the good song leading by our brother Dwight. And for all of our visitors that are here today, I know there are many, and I want you to know that you are our honored guest. And as has been mentioned, if you have a question or concern about things that are said or done, we want to entertain those even this very day and to sit down and talk with you about those very things. I encourage you to have your Bible still open to the book of James chapter 4. That's where we're going to uh, begin here in a few moments. I want to ask you a series of questions about some things you may or may not know. How many of you know how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon? Does anybody know that? Don't, don't answer out loud, just answer in your head. And if you don't know, that's okay. You don't have to know that. that that's fine. How many of you in this room know all 50 state capitals and the state of which they are a capital? Some of you might know that. Some of you may be learning that in school. But I'm here to tell you, if you don't know all 50 state capitals, you're okay. You don't have to, to know that. How many of you in this room know how to convert a Fahrenheit temperature to Celsius or Celsius to Fahrenheit? Do you know how to do that? I'm sure some of you know how to do that. But I'm telling you, if you don't know how to do that, that's okay. You don't have to know that. For those of you who are familiar with what we refer to as VCRs, do you know how to program your VCR to tape a program? Nobody knew that, but that's okay. You don't have to know that. Do you know how to bake cookies, to bake a cake? Do you know how to cook food? And some of you do, and some of you do very well, and some of you probably don't. That's okay. You don't have to know that. And we could go on and on and on with that. There's a million things you can go through this world and be successful and do not know. But I'm here to tell you there are some things you must know this day. You have to know these things that we're going to be talking about today because they are vital, because they are important, and you cannot be spiritually successful without knowing these five things we're going to list today. One thing you have to know today you must know is that life is brief. It is very brief. You remember where Nathan read for us a good, a good job a while ago in James 4? And verse 14 says, Life is a what? Life is a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Perhaps you had a cup of coffee this morning and saw the steam emanating from that cup. It was there and then it was gone. That is what our life is like. I need to be aware of that. Job had a lot to say about the brevity of life. Think about some of the things this man of patience had to say. In Job chapter 7, verses 6 and verse 7, he says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eye shall no more see good. A couple chapters later, Job chapter 9, Job 9, 25 and 26. Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away, they see no good. They are passed away, he says, as ships, as the eagle that hastens to the prey. And a little more of the man of patience. Job 14, maybe one or two pages on down in your Bible. Job 14, 1 and 2. Man that is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and is cut down. He flees also as a shadow and does not continue. Now the psalmist also reminds us a couple of ways about the brevity of life. For instance, in Psalm 89 and verse number 47, Psalm 89 and verse 47, the psalm writer pins these words, Remember how short my time is. Wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? You might highlight the first part of Psalm 89 and verse 47. One of the things the Bible calls upon us to remember is remember how short my time is. Psalm 102 and verse number three. Psalm 102 and verse number three. For my days are consumed like smoke and my bones are burned as an ark. So there's a lot of things that you don't have to know today. All those things we listed and hundreds of other things that you don't need to, you don't have to know those things. But one thing you must know today, one thing I must know today is that my life is brief and that's at best. Talk to somebody who is older. I'll let you determine what older is and they'll tell you how fast life goes by. It was yesterday that I was doing this and now 
I've achieved this age. Life is brief. And I must be aware of that. And you must be aware of that as well. But let me add a second thing that we must know. Not only must we know that life is brief, we also must know that death is certain. Death is a certain thing according to the word of God. Did you know that the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 9 and verse number 27, Hebrews 9 and verse 27, that it is appointed unto men once to what? Appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. I'm only going to live once and I'm only going to die once. That's according to Hebrews 9 and verse 27. If you're taking notes, you might jot down Ecclesiastes 9 and verse number 5 where the preacher there said that all the living, that's us, all the living shall know that they shall die. A sober reminder that my heart's still beating today and your lungs are still breathing today, but one day both of those actions will cease in my life. I must know this. You must know this as well. Again, Job had some things to say about this in Job chapter 30 and verse number 23. And of course, we all are probably pretty familiar with the story of Job and all of his sufferings and all the turmoil in his life. And he had a lot of misgivings about his own life at this point in time. In Job 30, in verse 23, the Bible records these words. For I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed, and listen to this very carefully, for all the living. I'm living and I must be aware, I, you must be aware that one day we will pass from this life. In that great book of Ecclesiastes, a couple of verses there, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 20. One of the things I appreciate about God's word is that it's clear, that it's simple, that it's succinct, and for me to, to misunderstand it would be my fault. Uh, it would be your fault if you didn't understand it because it's so clear. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 20. Try to misunderstand this. All go to one place. All are of the dust and all will turn to dust again. And that's very easy to understand those words. And finally, in the book of Ecclesiastes 9 and verse number 10. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse number 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. You may have heard of that verse before. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. Now listen to these words. You might highlight them. Whither thou goest. You might highlight that. There's nothing that I can do about my life that I have lived when I'm in the grave where the Bible says where I am going. Now I want to add a caveat here so that we all understand this. There is a point at which we will not die. There's a possibility that we will not die. Did you know that? The only thing that will prevent our deaths is if the Lord returns first because there will, be, there will be some people living when the Lord returns according to 1 Corinthians 15, 50, and 51 and also the verse we covered in Bible class, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Barring the second return of the Lord, I will have to die one day and you will too. And these are things I must know. I must know that my life is brief. I must know that death is certain. But think about some of these other things that I must know. In the book of Acts 10, in verse number 34, another thing that I must know is that judgment will be just. Judgment will be fair, you might say. In a world today full of course systems that are double standards, you can buy judges off with money, get your high-powered attorney out there, and he'll get you off of anything. And we've seen that before, haven't we? But with God, who has committed all judgment to his son Jesus, our judgment is going to be just, it's going to be fair, it's going to be equal. You might remember Peter, in his conversation with Cornelius, said in Acts 10 and verse 34, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. You remember that phrase in the Bible that appears several times that God is no respecter of persons? What does that mean? What that means is, is that if I want to go to heaven, I can go to heaven. If for some reason you don't want to go to heaven, you don't have to go. It's completely up to who? It's completely up to you. God will not say one day, I'm having a rough day. 
come back and talk to me later on. God doesn't have those kinds of days. God will not keep me from heaven because of the color of my skin. He will not keep me from heaven because I do or do not have a million dollars in the bank. He will not keep me from heaven if I'm driving a fancy car or I ride a bike everywhere. God will not keep me from heaven if I live in a mansion or in a cardboard box. God says if you want to go to heaven, you can go. And when the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons, that's what that means. Now, in the book of Matthew 22 and verse number 16, when the Bible here is recording the life of Jesus through the eyes and the pen of Levi, Matthew, the tax collector, in Matthew 22 and verse number 16, the Bible says they sent unto them their disciples with the Herodians. Master, we know, here's some things they knew. We know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Now, that sounds kind of odd, doesn't it? God doesn't care for any man. Jesus doesn't care for any man. It's saying the same thing we just mentioned a moment ago, that God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't care how much money I have, or God doesn't care how many friends you have. God doesn't care how prestigious of a job you have. All he cares about is that I've done the things that he's asked me to do. That's all he cares about. In Romans 2 and verse 11, Paul confirmed this when he writing to the church at Rome. In Romans 2 and verse 11, he says, For there is no respect of persons with God. With God and his son Jesus as your judge, you will get a fair judgment. You will get a just and equitable judgment once this life is over on this earth. You can take that to the bank and deposit it because that's never going to change. Judgment is going to be just. Do you know these things? That life is brief, that death is certain, that judgment is going to be fair, it's going to be just. You must know these things as you walk day to day on this earth. Here's something else that we must know. We must know that eternity is a long time. Eternity is a long time. You might recall when Jesus was near the Mount of Olives talking to his disciples, that famous discourse, the dividing of the sheep and the goats. Do you remember that? The sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And he, he divided them based on the fact that they did or did not help their fellow brethren when they were in need. At the end of that, he says in Matthew 25 and verse 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now the words that we want to focus in on there are the words everlasting and eternal in Matthew 25 and verse 46. Whatever my eternal fate is, whatever your eternal fate is, it's going to be forever. And there's nothing that I can do about it or to change it. In the book of Mark chapter 9, when talking about those who have lived a life that God is not pleased with, in Mark 9 and verse 44, it refers to folks who have been thrown into the hell fire, a fire that would not be quenched, and it says where their worm does not die. Now, maybe we didn't catch that the first time, so let's read verse 46. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And just perhaps, if we didn't catch it the first and second time, in verse 48, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. This is not a place I want to go. Is this a place that you want to go? I don't think anybody in their right mind would say, yes, sign me up. I want to go to heaven, don't you? I want to go to be with God forever. According to Psalm 16 and verse 11, it says, at the right hand of God, there are pleasures evermore. Pleasures that we cannot even begin to imagine. We can't fathom how beautiful, as we sing sometimes, how beautiful heaven must be, how grand it must be. Go read the entire chapter of Revelation 21 and find about the grandeur of heaven, that the streets are laid with what? The streets are laid with pure gold. All 12 gates are, each gate is made of what? 
Each gate is made of one pearl. There's no night there. God is the sun. He is the moon. He is the stars. He is the source of light. He is the source of warmth. The gates are not shut at all because it's always day. And there's no reason to worry about those who might rob us or thieve us or kill us or harm us because those have all been put away. If I were to come up to you and say, I have a million dollar check ready to sign to you, if you could adequately define eternity for me in a few words and convince me how long it is, how many people do you think we actually would sign that check over to? I don't know that I have the words to tell you how long eternity is. I don't know that you have the words either. I do remember a fellow one time saying this, that this is eternity. Imagine one ant, one ant, picking up one grain of sand off of the earth and taking that grain of sand to the moon and depositing that grain of sand on the moon, coming back and getting one more grain of sand off of the earth and take it back to the moon and keep doing that until all the sand on earth is on the moon and then eternity has just begun. It's like the song we sing, Amazing Grace. When we've been there, remember how many years? When we've been there, 10,000 years, we've just begun. My friends, life is brief. I'm not gonna live forever. I know that my death, barring the second coming of the Lord, is coming, so is yours. And by the way, death is no respecter of age either, is it? I imagine if I were to open the floor up to everybody who could tell me about a friend from school or about somebody we knew that passed away at an untimely age, we all would have a story, wouldn't we? Not a respecter of age. I'm going to be judged, so are you. And it's going to be fair, it's going to be equal. And I need to know, I must know, you must know, eternity is a long time. I must know that. And because all of those things are true, here's the fifth thing that I must know. Because life is brief, because death is certain, because judgment is just, and because eternity is long, the fifth thing that I must know is this, is that preparation is necessary. I must prepare myself for when these days are going to come. You remember the prophet of old, the sycamore gatherer, the farmer prophet, as we like to call him, Sometimes Amos chapter four and verse 12, one of the later prophets, by the way, when God has been calling his people, come back to me, come back, I will take you back, come back to me. Just do what I tell you to do and come back to me and I will bless you in ways that you can't even imagine of being blessed. And they kept saying, no, we will not come back. And Amos writes in Amos four and verse 12, oh, hear now, O Israel, prepare to me thy God. Now, those are sobering words, aren't they? Prepare to meet thy God. Now, you may be here today and wondering, how does one prepare to meet their God? What preparations are needed in order for me to be prepared to meet my God, to meet my maker, to meet my judge? That's an excellent question. And it's one that's worth answering, isn't it? Did you know that Jesus on a number of occasions said, he who has ears, let him what? Let him hear, Matthew eleven fifteen, 15. And to each of the seven Asian minor churches, he ended by saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. God says, you have to listen. Listen to what I have to say. Listen to my words. Hear these words. Do you know that Jesus also asked us to believe? In fact, he said it kind of in the negative way in John 8 and verse 24. Unless you believe that I am he, you will do what? You will die in your sins. I must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I must believe that the words in this book are the words of God. Did you know that without faith or belief, it's impossible to please God, according to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number six. So God says, I want you to, to, to hear. I want you to, I want you to listen to the words in this book. And as you read the words in this book, you'll begin to realize that faith and belief are very important. Now, we talked about this in class for a few moments, but Jesus even calls upon us to repent. 
Luke 13, 3 and Luke 13 and verse 5, Jesus says, except you repent, you all shall likewise perish. You know that verse probably very well. Repentance means I have to make a change. I have to change the way that I have been living and mend my way to God's way and to do things his way. One of the best examples in the Bible of this is in the book of Matthew 21, 28 through 30, when a man who had a vineyard, a farm, had two sons, and he sent his sons out to go into work. Now, I want to start backwards here. The second son he said to go out and work said, um, I will, but he never went. He just lied. The first son said, um, I won't. I will not go and work. But the text says he repented and he went to work. That's a great picture of repentance in the Bible. He changed his mind, which led to a change of conduct. Do you see that? God says, I need you to change. Now, some people have a lot more changing to do than others. And in my experience, and probably years as well, you may be studying with somebody who's very moral, very ethical, maybe like Cornelius or Lydia or the eunuch in the book of Acts. They have very little changing to do except to comply with God's commands. That's great. Some people have more changing to do than others. But change it must be according to the word of God. Did you also know that Jesus expects us to confess him before men? Jesus called upon us to do that in Matthew 10, 32 and 33. He who confesses me before men, the same I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. By the way, the next verse goes on to say that if I deny him, <coughs> that he will deny me according to Matthew 10 and verse 33. The confession is the same one the eunuch made in Acts 8 and verse 37 when he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Have you made that confession? You're going to be provided the opportunity in just a few moments to make that good and noble confession that's made with the mouth according to Romans 10, 9 and 10 that leads to salvation. Have you made that confession? That I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, if you know the story of the eunuch very well in the book of Acts 8, once he made that confession, he went on his way rejoicing, didn't he? Is that true? Did he go on his way rejoicing after he made that confession? Well, he did, but wasn't there something that occurred between? And the answer is yes. That based upon his confession, Philip took the eunuch down to the water. They both went down into the water, and they came up out of the water. The text says he baptized him, and then he did it. Then he went on his way what? Then he went on his way rejoicing. I really don't know of any other example in the Bible to show that baptism is an immersion than the fact that he went down into the water and came back up out of the water. Now, we're not trying to pick on anybody necessarily, but you cannot do that when you're sprinkling or pouring water on somebody. You just cannot do that. You remember when Jesus was baptized, according to Matthew chapter 3, he came up out of the water. So we're forced to conclude that if he came up out of the water, he must have done what? He must have went down into the water. We're buried with him in baptism, according to Colossians 2 and verse 12. And did you know that baptism saves us, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. One of my favorite, non-favorite conversations I've ever had with somebody when talking about baptism is they read to me 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, in which it says, baptism with also now save us, and, and they seriously looked at that man and said, now let me tell you why baptism doesn't save us. It's like, are you, are you serious? How can you say that? Because the text says, baptism doth also now save us. It is not for, um, uh, baptism is not an outward sign of an inward grace, as we're told sometimes. It is for the remission of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. It is for the washing away of sins, Acts 22 and verse 16. About 3,000 folks on the day of Pentecost did this, according to Acts 2 and verse 41, when, when they asked, what shall we do? Repent and be what? Repent and be baptized, Acts 2 and verse 38. Now, somebody may say, now, once I'm baptized, I'm done. I've done everything that's necessary of me to do. And I'm afraid our, our five steps sometimes have led us to believe. That's all I have to do. Is it? As a new Christian, today when you confess Christ before this audience and are immersed in the waters of baptism, you become a child of God. God adds you to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. But laid upon you then is the responsibility to live faithfully 
as a child of God. Not perfectly, but faithfully as a child of God. Didn't Jesus say that in Revelation 2 and verse 10? Be thou faithful until death, and I will receive a crown of life. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Mark 13 and verse 13. So these are some things that you must know. Do you know today? If you didn't know these things, surely you know them now. You must know that life is brief. You must know that my death is pending. I have an appointment with it, so do you. I don't know when it is. Very few men have known when they're going to die. I know of one. You remember the fellow by the name of Hezekiah who was told he had 15 years to live. I don't know that, do you? Nobody's told me that. I could die this afternoon. I'm not trying to be morbid or anything. That's why I made it me, not you. But it's possible. I might live for another 40, 50 years. I don't know. But it's certain unless the Lord returns first. And I need to know that once I pass from this life, the judgment's coming and that it's going to be fair, that it's going to be just, it's going to be equitable, and that after judgment, I'm going to spend eternity somewhere, either heaven or in hell, and that's, eternity is a very long time. And because I know those things, I need to prepare myself. And we went over that with a fine-tooth comb, as we like to say. Now, now it's up to you. Now that you know those things, have you been baptized? Have you had your sins washed away through the avenue of baptism? If not, are you willing to confess that Jesus is the Son of God and to do so? We would love nothing more than to see that again like we did on our past Wednesday night here at Wellsburg. Maybe you are a child of God. Maybe, maybe there's a, a life that you're living that you know is not uh, in congruence with God's Word. It's time to come back. We will not make you feel ashamed. We will not belittle you. In fact, we'll applaud you for your courage to let others know I'm struggling with this sin, and we'll help you with it. We'll pray with you. We'll pray to God, who promises that he will forgive in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. So if you need to answer God's call through baptism or as a child of God to renew your life to him, listen now as we stand.